Hello, my dear students, and welcome to chapter four. I have decided to break this chapter into four parts. As I look at your book, I don't disagree with the author's arrangement, but you often see the topics I'm going to break this down into in separate chapters. And that must be one of the hardest parts of writing a chemistry textbook is deciding on both the order and the arrangement of the topics because I always like to say most students don't learn chemistry until they take it the second time because you need, you really need the big picture to understand the details and yet you're not going to get the big picture unless you get the details and I have to go over a lot of these things, or certainly had to when I was learning it many times before I got them. And it was the same way when I went on in chemistry. I'm glad I saved my chemistry textbooks, and today I'm glad there's Chem Libre, because <clears throat> when I took, for example, organic chemistry, or even second semester freshman chemistry, I had to refer back to the things, I guess you could say, I should have learned to uh, prepare me for the subsequent uh, thing, things that you learn. Topics was the word I was looking for there. So this chapter, as you saw in the previous slide, I could go back if I knew how, is reactions in aqueous solution. And when we talked about reactions, they gave us three examples, you know, addition, degradation, etc. But I said at the time, there are many more reactions, depending on how you classify them. We're going to look on three separate, uh, I won't say days, but they should be days, three separate topics. If I were teaching them, I would not combine them. I would do them one at a time. The first one is a double displacement reaction or double replacement reaction or metathesis reaction, as your book refers to it. And then we'll also be looking at in subsequent screencast over chapter four, each section with a separate assignment or exercise, we'll be looking at two other main types of reactions and that is or those are acid-base reactions and oxidation-reduction reactions, better known as redox reactions. And then we'll finish everything up with uh, a discussion of solution stoichiometry. So I'm really only going to cover the first 13 slides in this. And it de deals with reactions in aqueous solution. And so often, when you think of a chemist, you think of him holding up test tubes and mixing solutions. And solution chemistry and aqueous reactions is really where it's at, especially considering my background as a biochemist, where water is the solvent of life. And all, almost all the reactions occur in solution. They may all occur in solution, but may not all occur in aqueous solution. For example, certain reactions that occur only in the membranes. But that being said, Let's talk about some of these topics about working in solution. And you should know what a solution is. It's a very homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Salt dissolved in water, sugar dissolved in water, uh, the cellular milieu dissolved in the cytoplasm, which is mainly water. And for the reactions of life, of course, the solvent of life is water. The solvent... It's the thing that dissolves everything else or that everything else is dissolved into. And yet when we talk about solvent, a strict definition is the substance present in greatest abundance. And let me give you an example. Let's talk about, I'm assuming everybody's 21 here, um, that we're mixing alcohol and water. We're making vodka. Okay. Typical vodka might be 80 proof, more premium ones, 100 proof. Well, 80 proof is double the percentage. And what it means is that it's 40% alcohol, okay? So water is our solvent. 
it's present in the greatest amount. 60% water, 40% alcohol or ethyl alcohol or grain alcohol or ethanol. It goes by many names and we'll talk about its formula. Its formula looks something like this. A carbon with three hydrogens attached to it and a second carbon with two hydrogens attached to it and a hydroxyl group, which in this case is an alcoholic OH or, you know, uh, what would by itself, if it could come off and it can't come off and break this covalent bond, uh, this group would also be a hydroxide anion. We'll get to that when we talk about acids and bases. Anyway, this is ethanol. Um, and if you mix it, what happens when you go over 50-50? What happens if you have 120 proof alcohol? Then you have water dissolved in the alcohol. And it's just really semantics. But in addition, you might have a flavored alcohol. Orange flavored alcohol or mint flavored alcohol, etc. And you may have other substances dissolved in the alcohol or the water, if the water is uh, present in the greater amount. But, and those two substances, by the way, we, both, we term miscible. Um, and that means they're infinitely mixable. And uh, you can go from 1% alcohol to 99% water. You can go from 1% alcohol and 99% water to 1% water and 99% alcohol. Um, other substances that you might dissolve in there, for example, flavors, and the example I've chosen, not sure it's totally appropriate for our younger audience, but um, would be termed solutes in a chemistry lab. Okay? And... When water is a solvent, of course, we're dealing with aqueous solutions. And when we're talking about our state, when we write our chemical equations, remember, we wrote some things that were little s for solid, little g for gas, little l for liquid. And then we had this other one called aq. And now I'm going to tell you what that means. That means it's dissolved into water. This is part of an aqueous solution. And when you type these on the typewriter, these are all in parentheses. They're all lowercase. And they are all italicized. Okay? Small, lowercase, italicized letters. It's the formal way of doing it. So, um, I should have chosen our example of methanol here. Anyway, in these aqueous solutions, they um, dissolve different ways. It says it dissolves by dissociation, but what they're really doing is working into the structure of water. If you look at the structure of water with its polar bonds, the water molecule in the bonds that form, those electrons are shared, but they're not shared equally because the oxygen atom is an electronegative atom. And as a result, the electrons are drawn into the molecule toward the oxygen. And when that happens, you have electrons spending more time up here around the oxygen than they do down here around the hydrogens, okay? So, the result is that we end up with what we call a polar molecule. It has two poles. A partial negative pole, which we designate little lowercase delta negative, and a positive side to the molecule, each hydrogen having a partial positive charge. Now, overall, water is not charged. It will not conduct electricity, as we'll see. And yet, this is very polar because it has a negative side and a positive side. This explains the properties of water. 
and why water molecules stick together and beat up because they're all sticking to each other because the negatives attract the positives. Well, if I can blow this up, if you look, here is a purple sodium. I cannot write using this, but right here in the middle is a purple sodium. And if you look, the negatively, partially negatively charged oxygen is surrounding it, forming a cage. It's actually called a clathrate. But the cage around it allows that sodium ion to be accommodated in the structure of water. And the big green chloride ion, down here a little bit, is surrounded by water molecules too, but in this case, they align with the positive side, pointing at the Cl minus charge, uh, the negatively charged chloride ion, and seek to neutralize it. And this is how salts dissolve. Other molecules like methanol, which has an OH group, that oxygen in the methanol, right there, that oxygen will align with the positively charged hydrogens and hydrogen bond to them. I did not mean to shut my whole um, my whole PowerPoint uh, file down. So here is methanol and the positive hydrogen, partial positive, polar hydrogen would surround the methanol and even though the carbon and the hydrocarbon end of the molecule is not particularly soluble, this makes it fairly soluble and easily accommodated within the structure of water. Um, and they do not dissociate. Of course, the sodium and the chloride come apart to bond into the water. The chloride here the sodium here and here being accommodated in the structure of the water. Um, some things don't dissolve in water because they react with it. Now, if you dissolve into water like sodium chloride, you then dissociate, separate into sodium ions and the negatively charged chloride anion. This makes this changes the property of water and allows it to now conduct a current. Pure water does not conduct a current. But when you dissolve a salt in there, it will now conduct a current because you have a charged species. This, another word for this salt now, or another category it falls into is that of electrolyte. You've heard of electrolytes when you talk about drinking Gatorade filled with electrolytes, uh, salt, but other good salts too, like potassium as well. Uh, but any salt, potassium, uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, calcium ions, iodide ion ions, uh, polyatomic ions, phosphate ions, sulfate ions, anything with a charge will allow that water to conduct electricity. So ionic substances are um, electrolytes if they dissolve in water. We'll talk about what dissolves and what doesn't. The things like alcohol, sugar, many uncharged molecular compounds will not cause water to, because they're not charged, conduct a current, and therefore they are not electrolytes. Some molecular compounds, acids, bases, even complex molecules like proteins and the like, um, can be electrolytes. If they dissociate completely, they're strong, and if they do not separate completely, they're weak electrolytes. It's a distinction we'll see later. So, if I were to hook up a circuit with a light bulb in it, right here, and 
this goes back to a power source. If I can draw a power source in there, let's make put a battery in there. And it comes back around here to the other side of the light bulb. And of course, this circuit is completed with the light bulb. Then if I put it into water, water will not carry or conduct a current and complete that circuit. And if you dissolve sugar, glucose, sucrose in this case, this is just some table sugar, even though it dissolves, it will still not complete that circuit. But if you put a little salt in it with all those positive and negative charges, then you will complete the circuit and allow the light bulb to light up. So a strong electrolyte will, at very low concentration, light that bulb and light it up very brightly. A weak electrolyte will allow a current to be conducted, but the bulb will be dim. Um, and you can measure that conductivity with a conductivity meter. One of the problems of teaching this online, it makes it hard for me to pull you into the lab and show you these things. So, electrolyte is just a name for a substance that is charged and dissolves in water. Now, not all compounds are soluble. And we have some solubility rules. And I'm going to try to simplify them. If the salt is a nitrate salt or an acetate salt, it is soluble in water. For example, if I want to make sure something is soluble when I'm making up solutions in the lab, I order nitrate or acetate salts. This is the acetate anion. This is acetic acid without the H. And sodium acetate is a classic example. Now, there are some other rules, but they get complicated. So I just want you to remember this one. Nitrates, there's that nitrate anion, polyatomic ion, and acetates. Let me write that down. Nitrates. Those are NO3 minus and acetates. Sometimes you'll actually see it, and you'll see it in some of the homework problems, AC minus. There's no element AC. Well, maybe there is. I'm trying to think, but I don't know. We frequently abbreviate AC, but the proper abbreviation would be C2H3O2 minus. C2H3O2 minus. Although they have written it in its linear structural formula to give you an idea of how the atoms are arranged. Now... This, um, these two are always soluble, always soluble, okay? Chlorides, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, tend to be soluble except for what I call the terrible three, silver, mercury, and lead. Kind of hang out down there in the lower right of the uh, transition metals and metals, um, over toward the um, stair-step line going through the periodic table. Silver salts, mercury salts, and lead salts are notoriously insoluble in water. And if I want to make a silver solution, for example, which we use a lot, I order silver nitrate, lead, I tend to order lead nitrate or lead acetate, uh, we're not really supposed to use lead anymore, and we're certainly not supposed to use mercury compounds anymore just because of their toxicity. So sometimes when I want to demonstrate precipitation reactions, I frequently use silver. Silver chloride being one of the most insoluble ionic compounds there is. Bromide salts tend to be soluble, with the exception of silver, mercury, and lead. Iodide salts... Potassium iodide, sodium iodide tend to be insoluble with the exception of silver, mercury, and lead. And sulfates tend to be soluble with the exception of silver, mercury, and lead, and you add strontium. That's too much to remember. 
What I want you to remember is nitrate and acetate salts tend to be soluble. And then I'd like you to remember about silver, mercury, and lead. Okay? Now, um, a lot of other compounds tend to be insoluble. Um, ammonium compounds... tend to be soluble okay I would have included it in the stable carbonates tend to be insoluble you know that calcium carbonate limestone okay blow co2 into certain solutions lime water and the like and you'll see precipitates all the time uh, phosphates tend to be insoluble uh, when I do use Phosphates, I tend to order, well, the acid form, but, um, uh, and the, like I say, the alkali metal cations, which would be sodium phosphate, potassium phosphate, those are all soluble, but ammonium salts are almost always soluble. Most group one salts are soluble, or all group one, group one, that's the alkali metals are also always soluble, okay? Um, and then they go into the group twos. Group twos are soluble except for calcium, strontium, and barium, which means magnesium. So in general, if you're a sulfide, a carbonate, a phosphate, or a hydroxide, unless you're made with ammonium, the ammonium ion, or a group one metal, lithium, sodium, potassium. We tend not to use rubidium and cesium because they start getting expensive. But um, those group one salts are soluble. So this is the other rule I want you to remember. Nitrates are always soluble. Acetates are always soluble. Ammonium salts are always soluble. And group one salts are always soluble. After that, things tend to precipitate. If you need more specifics, you can refer to a table of solubility, and I will provide that um, whenever you do an assignment or a test. Now, what happens when you mix something like potassium iodide, which is soluble? It's a potassium group 1 metal, so it's soluble. And lead nitrate, this is lead 2 nitrate, so I need two of those. This is a nitrate, so because it's a nitrate salt, it's soluble. It forms a clear, colorless solution. Potassium iodide forms a clear, colorless solution. Okay, But when you mix them together you get this beautiful, beautiful lead iodide and beautiful canary yellow precipitate. Brilliant colors, incredible whites. Lead salts were used as pigments in paints for years because they are colorful and good pigments. Unfortunately, lead is not salts are not soluble in water, but they are soluble in acids, even weak acids, like the body is full of. So, um, these lead salts are pretty insoluble, but when a child puts it into his or her mouth, into their mouth, you end up with what? Them eating and dissolving it, eating chips of paint or eating lead toys, putting toys in their mouth with lead-based paints on them. The lead finds itself to, its stu to your stomach, which is an extremely strongly acidic solution or contains a st extremely strong acidic solution. And the lead goes into your body and it's very, very toxic, very bad for your brain and it accumulates. So there is no minimum safe amount. When I mix these two together, this insoluble salt is formed. 
So I mixed lead nitrate and potassium iodide, and I got lead, potassium nitrate and lead iodide. So I had lead nitrate and potassium iodide, and I ended up with potassium nitrate and lead iodide. The lead iodide is not soluble, and it comes out of solution and forms what we call a precipitate. Okay. This is called a metathesis re reaction. Um, there's a, you also have metathesis in grammar when you switch sounds in a word. Certain, I've heard Creole dialects tend to do that, but um, it means to transpose, but let's just look at it as changing partners, okay? So here's another reaction. Silver nitrate, aqueous, dissolved in water. Potassium chloride, dissolved in water. This is a nitrate salt, so it is soluble in water. This is a group one metal salt, so it is soluble in water. But then we form silver chloride, and look at its state designation, solid. This formed a precipitate, and potassium nitrate, which is still quite soluble, okay? I like to refer to this as a double displacement reaction. Rxn for reaction, okay? So, in this case, what did we do? The silver went with the chloride, and the potassium went with the nitrates. It's like dancing. What we did was we changed partners. The nitrate was with the silver, and now the nitrate is with the potassium. And the chloride was with the potassium, and now it's with the silver. This is also sometimes called a double replacement, because I think you can see what we've done. We've replaced and changed dance partners. Okay, And in this case, when we did it, one of the compounds formed is insoluble. When we look at reactions, I was always taught there are three ways to tell a reaction has occurred. A precipitate is formed, a gas, bubbles of gas, a gas is evolved, or there's a change in color. We see the gas bubbles a lot when we are doing um, reactions with acids, uh, reduced metals with acids, but also um, in acid neutralizations. We also see changes of color in the oxidation reactions we're going to talk about next. So, um, color change. And we're going to talk about these precipitates and practice a few problems with them on our assignment. So, when we're talking about these equations, we're going to see three types of reaction equations that we're going to be dealing with. Anyway, when you are given something, if I can go back, like I make silver nitrate and potassium chloride write the products and give their states. Well, changing partners is easy, but what's next? So use the chemical formulas of the reactants and think about which ions are present because we're going to write something called an ionic equation in a minute. Write formulas for the products, the cation from one and the anion from the other, and switch them. Now, to balance it, you need to remember that the new compounds you form have to balance, okay? They have to be balanced and they have no charge. It must have a net zero charge. And then you check your solubility rules to see if a precipitate forms, and I would balance the equation as I'm doing this. So, 
we're going to write three different types of equations. A molecular equation, or this is sometimes just called the chemical equation. Overall balanced chemical equation, okay? Always balanced. The complete ionic equation, because when we write sodium chloride and it's aqueous in water, as soon as we put that in water, it breaks apart into sodium plus plus chloride minus. Similarly, when I had silver nitrate, uh, let me do silver sulfate. That's not soluble. Um, let me do, let me do this. Let me do lead nitrate. Because I don't want one and one. This separates into if it's lead 2 nitrate, Pb2 plus, plus 2 NO3 minus, because nitrate is always minus 1. So when we draw it this way, um, dissolve these in water, these ionic species of these electrolytes separate and incorporate into the structure of water or dissolve, okay? So we can write sodium chloride as sodium chloride in our chemical equation, or we can write it as sodium plus plus chloride minus. If we needed two of them, we would just do this. Use our coefficients. One of the things I want to show you later, though, is that we're going to balance this equation and do a mathematical operation where we subtract like quantities from both sides. And I'll tell you about the net ionic equation in a minute because it simplifies how we write these precipitation reactions. So let's mix silver nitrate and potassium chloride to make silver chloride plus potassium nitrate. See where I'm going. Okay, so... Remember, this can be written as silver ions plus nitrate ions. This can be written as, let me do it down here. That was a minus. Potassium ions plus chloride ions. Okay? And I see why they did it, because I'm already running out of room. This cannot be written as silver plus chloride because it's insoluble. It doesn't separate or dissociate. It doesn't dissolve. It stays together. And this separates into potassium ions plus nitrate ions. Okay, I didn't put the state functions on any of these because I didn't want to take the room. But let me just state that again. The silver nitrate breaks down into silver ions and nitrate ions. The potassium chloride breaks down into potassium ions and chloride ions. By breakdown, I mean dissociates into potassium and chloride ions. The silver chloride is insoluble. It doesn't dissociate and then we have potassium ions and nitrate ions in our potassium nitrate product, okay, where we change partners. The so nitrate started with the silver and ended up with the potassium. The chloride started with the potassium and ended up with the silver, AG or argentum for silver. So, going back, our silver and nitrate come together, our potassium and chloride come together, silver chloride precipitates out, and potassium and nitrate. But look, if we consider this an equation analogous to a mathematical equation, we said earlier that, you know, we make the equal signs, instead of an equal signs, we use an arrow. And I'm not a big fan of arrows, even ones drawn like this, because I'm a biochemist, and I know most reactions are, well, every reaction to some degree is reversible, though some are 
essentially irreversible. But the back reaction can occur too. So you will also see this written sometimes like this, especially in the second semester when we start discussing aspects of equilibria. Okay? So let me take those away. And go back to the fact that this equation has potassium ions on both sides. And it has nitrate ions on both sides. So if I subtract those from both sides of the equations, I get what we call my net ionic equation. Silver plus chloride react together to form an insoluble precipitate of silver chloride. That is really the essence of it. The potassium and nitrate aren't participating in the reaction. The potassium here and here, and the nitrate here and here are termed spectator ions because they're just kind of hanging around, not reacting, not doing anything. And so we can, as you see here, cross them out to get our net ionic equation, which is not written here, but I wrote it in the last one. When you take everything here that's crossed out, what you get is a simplified Ag plus silver ions plus chloride ions, Cl minus, combined to form the insoluble silver chloride salt. And it's still an ionic compound, but it is not soluble in water. It is not an electrolyte. And this is my net ionic equation. I'm going to have you practice that doing one reaction of your choosing from my list. So, in your assignment. So, we write a balanced equation first. Then, we might write a complete I've also heard it called an overall ionic equation, where instead of writing, for example, sodium chloride, we write sodium plus plus chloride minus. We subtract species that are found on both sides of the equation, and we're left with the net ionic equation. And check out the assignment. I recommend you try it before we move on. Some of the one assignments in the book assume you've already read through to the end of the chapter and incorporate really multi-step operations that really require you to be practicing two concepts at once. So please, you're welcome to try the, <laughs> if you're into that, uh, the problems at the end of the chapter, but try and solve my problems in the assignment 4.1, and I'll see you for the next part of this chapter. Uh, I have debated whether or not to post them sequentially so as not to overwhelm you, but I apologize. I meant to have these done, not done, they've been done, but or they will have been done, but I'm not going to get up there until Monday to get these posted. So I may go ahead and post them all. And you work at them asynchronously as you get to them. But don't take too long because uh, before the end of the week, I'm going to get a couple of other things posted at the end of the week. So uh, this has been 4.1. Try the assignment the accompanying assignment i'll try and post it right below this and see you in 4.2 if i can get to my stop goodbye now <laughs>